Welcome to the Pursuit of the Perfect Race. I'm Coach Terry Wilson, and with each episode, I bring stories of athletes to you that share their experiences at races in order for you to learn how to have your perfect race. We will hear stories from athletes of all ages, abilities, and races of all distances. So regardless of where you fit in, there's something in there for you. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Now let the pursuit begin. Thanks for having me. Hey, you're welcome. So what made you want to do this race in the first place? You know, actually, uh, after my last 100, I uh, I didn't think I was going to be running 100 miles again, uh, to be quite honest with you. Um, I didn't necessarily have the uh, uh, the the drive to do it again, but, um, you know, when you put it into a whole series, it uh, becomes more appealing because it's uh, just one, less th- one, one more thing that I wanted to do, I guess. And so, um, Leadville is just a beautiful place though. Um, spent a lot of time up there, you know, last year, especially since moving here. Um, and, uh, came around November or so, something like that. I, you know, I, I learned that about the lead man series and that if you do all of them, you can get into all the races and there's, it's a pretty easy entry into all of it, I guess you can say. So, um, yeah, that's, I mean, it, it, the location, um, you know, I had friends up there. Uh, it just it just all made sense to do a local race and uh, and just to test myself once again on the hundred miles, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so Leadman is five a series of five races, and basically it starts off with I think it's back in June sometime. It's just the schedule is available online, but um, it starts off with a marathon um, up at ele- elevation, and that is on. Um, the other side of Leadville that we do the 100 on. So it's on, on the, uh, I believe it's the east side. And it's a little bit steeper terrain. So you've got a marathon um, that's got all the hard stuff definitely in it. Um, and so that starts off in the marathon, and then we roll into the the Silver Rush Series, which there's two races. And if you're crazy enough, you can do both of them. I elected only to do one. That was only, you only have to do one of them. And I chose the, the mountain biking. So the mountain biking was uh, 50 miles. And again, that's on the same side, run along the same courses and stuff as the uh, the marathon, or the same same trails as the marathon. And uh, the next day, you get the pleasure of, uh, or actually, I, I I did pay some people the next day during the, the Silver Rush 50 miler run, and uh, got to kind of run around on course. I actually helped clean up the course and everything like that um, while I was doing it, since I was doing it for fun. Uh, no official time or anything like that. Just about 30 miles of running. Uh, the day after the, the, the bike, then you roll into the hundred mile bike. Then, then you get to wake up the next day and do a 10 K just for, you know, shake out or run. And then you roll into six days later, you do the hundred mile run. So five, five races total. And if you get through all of them, um, you do have to finish under certain times and everything like that to move on as a lead man. And I think we started with around 100, 99 or 100, something like that. And we finished up with 44 total, actually completed the whole Lead Man series. I did. I wow. did. The hun- they saved the best for last, and that's the 100-mile run, and that's the most terrifying, I guess. <laughs> wow. So, you know, I did a lot on course. I was very fortunate. Um, my girlfriend bought a house up there right on 7th Street. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time up there this summer, um, nearly every weekend, actually. Um, I go up there and ride at elevation, run at elevation, um, and I think it really helped out. I mean, it, 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 I didn't do as much time up there as I wanted to, uh, you know, but I did a couple good long runs, good long rides. Um, I got to see the course. Um, it hailed, snowed, or rained on me just about every day uh, in Leadville fashion. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was just beautiful training up there. It really was. Uh, and then down here in where I live in Lakewood on the west side of Denver, I basically did a lot of the flat runs, um, a little bit of hills mixed in, but really um, nothing like actually being up in that. <laughs> so, you know, you have a lot of focus training. Uh, you want to actually program your program at a certain point. You know, you want to have some focus. 
I think I think that you hit you hit the nail on the head as far as the confidence goes. That's really what I was looking for the most is um, trying to be confident because these these longer ultra races, as you know, um, it's mind over matter. I mean, especially when you get into these hundred mile ultra runs. Um, I've heard about people putting in a hundred, even two hundred miles a week of running, and when you're balancing that with mountain biking, it's uh, that creates a long day when you're working a full time job and everything else. It's hard to get that kind of mileage in. Um, uh, oh, <laughs> well, the thing is, is, yeah, I mean, I work full time and trying to get in mountain biking and running because you're training for both events. That was the real challenge. So I would say that I probably did half as much training as I think that uh, most people should have for this type of event. Uh, I was only, I wasn't, I was capping out maybe 50 miles a week would be an incredible amount of, uh, of mileage for me a week. Um, whereas, but I, th- but I honestly think that for a hundred mile run, I think 70 miles a week can prepare you, I would say, uh, mentally, um, physically. Um, capping out at that, that 70 miles a week, I think, is a really good lofty goal. I never hit it, though. Um, I was trying to balance life. Okay. So, you know, for that time, do you have a confident build-up in late? What happens when you're going to have an hour and a half to let them? About an hour 45. Okay. Yep. Yeah, time, time it right. You can get up there pretty quick. Yep. Okay. And I'll explain. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I've never been good at that. And any, <laughs> any of my, any of my friends would say that about me, you know, they, they, they laugh because, you know, I'll, uh, sign up for a hundred mile or whatever it may be a week before, uh, I've, I'm known to do an Ironman on six days notice. And, uh, I think that's where that confidence comes in. You come in and you get your mind in the right place. And a lot of times your body can take you through. Um, but balancing the training and everything, I also started a master's program two weeks ago. So the week of the hundred run, I was starting my master's program and, uh, no, no master's in health administration. Yeah. School master's. Yeah. (laughs) So, uh, that was a little bit stressful getting kicked off, starting a master's program right as I'm going into a hundred mile run. Um, but you know, the balance is, uh, like I said, it's tough. I, I reached out to, to our, our big sexy racing teammates and just said, how do you guys do it? Because I've always struggled with that. And uh, I really admire the people that, that can get it in. Um, because I know, I mean, I love my downtime. I love being lazy. I love walking my dog. I love doing all that other fun stuff too. So, you know, doing these crazy long races and whatnot, um, I mean, it, it, it does take a lot of organization, a lot of dedication, and a lot of understanding. And uh, I, like I said, I admire the people that can really nail it because I'm, I'm definitely a slacker when it comes to all that. So this is great. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, one of the things that that we've tried to do, and um, I think I think is awesome, is she's been very flexible. She bought a mountain bike. Uh, I got her a bike to to pace me on the trails and so at least the the uh, pathways here in Lakewood. So she would hop on a bike and crank up some music on the back of the of the bike and, and go with me on a run. And I think that she wanted to be out there with me and whatnot. Um, and that really helped out. Um, I like having her there and, um, you know, these, these long runs and these long rides, they get kind of lonely out there sometimes. So dragging along somebody else is, uh, is always nice, but you know, it took some understanding or, you know, and communication, I think is also another key thing. Just letting her know, Hey, these are the big long days I've got. Um, you know, uh, and, and I'd always run a buyer to and just say, Hey, is this okay? Or, you know, do you have anything to do that day and whatnot? So we tried to work it out. Um, it, it didn't always go smooth, but you know, she's very understanding and, um, and was definitely my number one fan during all of this and support. Okay. So, yeah. now, what kind of plan are you using? <laughs> uh, I'm talking to a coach. I should probably say, a, you know, a very detailed, very organized plan, but, um, actually I didn't have one at all. Really? Believe it or not. Uh, no plan. And I think, that, I think I'm the, I'm a coach's worst nightmare. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I literally, you know, started doing this years ago uh, before my first Ironman, Ironman, Texas, I think it was 2012, uh, when I was with Moxie, Moxie Multisport. 
you know, my teammates were all laughing because six weeks before Ironman Texas, I said, I remember turning to everybody during the workout and I said, you know, I guess I better download a plan and get going on this thing. And they all said, what? You know, you got six weeks on Ironman Texas and you're just now. And I said, yeah, you know, this it's okay. And uh, long story short, I, I kind of just listen to my body and find out what what I'm missing. You know, if it's speed work, I'll do speed work that day. If I feel like, you know, I haven't gotten any long runs in, I'll get a long run in. I haven't gotten a long ride in because, you know, I'm doing a lead man. I go out and do a long ride. I, I kind of try to figure out what my body needs the most. And, uh, and yeah, that doesn't go with any kind of coaching plan whatsoever. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense now. You know, I'd have to go back and look at look at the hours per week. Um, but there were days that, you know, I was definitely out on the bike for five, six hours, you know, into brutal headwinds and climbing mountains. Um, and then there were days where, like, I was with my friend George, and we were going up and over Hope Pass twice, you George. know. And that, uh, yeah, my friend George from from Texas, Hutto, Hutto, Texas. So, yeah, he came up here, and he spent uh, three months, I believe, is his, his dedicated time to get ready for the 100. And so he came up, and he was uh, – I've been racing with George for a long time, and we go back, and there's uh, a lot of pictures of us trail racing down in Texas and um, doing the uh, – Oh, what was the series down there? Uh, some of the Tejas trails races and stuff like that in the X Terra. And so he came up and, and yeah, he was, uh, he was out there. Uh, he's done the hundred before and he, uh, knew the course really well. So he helped me out and, t- and took out my, my line of thinking regarding, you know, the, the race planning and everything. He was right there telling me, Oh, this is what you want to do for this. And this is what you want to do for that. So I was out there with him scoping out the course beforehand. Nice. Yeah. Oh, Uh, you know, the, the, the buildup that happens with the, the marathon was a real kicker. It, it told me what I needed to do. Um, it, it kind of, it kind of woke me up a little bit as far as, you know, Hey, this is altitude. This is a lot of climbing. Um, I think that some of the hiking I did just casual, uh, casual hiking, some of the 14ers and stuff last year that started getting me definitely acc- acc- uh, acclimated to the altitude and whatnot. Um, but the confidence came, I think, from those long, you know, doing the sections of the course, understanding what's ahead, um, you know, being reserved at certain times, knowing when you can open it up and maybe get actually some good running in. I say good running, you know, 10-minute mile, something like that. <laughs> nice and easy. But I think knowing what's ahead, forecasting the course, um, and then being prepared equipment-wise, you know having the right shoes, having the right vest, all that stuff, because every little tiny thing, you know, come mile 70 starts to really weigh on you. Um, being prepared for the conditions too. I mean, I was out there, I can't tell you, like I said, how many times it, it would start off at 70 degrees and then I get to a peak and it'd be 30 degrees and snowing. I mean, and this happened nearly every training run, nearly every tra- training ride up in Ledford. I mean, every single day. <laughs> wow. It was mind blowing. It even happened, it even happened here in Lakewood the week of I think the week that the hundred was so last last this past weekend the week before it hailed quarter size hail on me while I was out on a training run you know here in Lakewood not but two miles from from my house and I mean it was freezing cold and it was like a monsoon and then hail came and it just beat me up so I think the, those when that weather happens that definitely prepares you mentally I think too to be able to handle that when it comes around uh, come race day. Yeah. You know, Leadville's Leadville. I was told again at 100 miles, you just don't really know what to expect. At least I didn't. Um, and the one, there's a couple things. <laughs> one of them, they always say, you never use anything new on race day. Well, I'm definitely the guy that goes against all that grain. Uh, I used poles, which I had never used before. Um, actual running, you know, b- uh, trifold poles for the climbs and so forth, um, which was a godsend. Um, I used brand new shoes on um, race day, shoes that I had, the model that I had run in before and everything, but I used brand new shoes. Um, and I did have two to three other pair on reserve too that I was going to swap into. Um, <clears throat> the hydration pack, you know, uh, some of the faster guys out on course, um, they may have opted for no hydration pack. You know, these guys are flying and it's a well-supported course. 
Um, but I definitely needed to do to carry stuff, uh, especially the water. You never know how long you're going to be out there. You never know what's going to happen. Um, so I tried a new pack that I got delivered the, the day before the race, and that was a regrettable decision. Um, but, you know, I ended up sw- switching back to my old pack at, um, at the turnaround point down at Winfield. I went back to my other hydration pack. And then the, the biggest thing, I think, for that bill is the unpredictable weather. So being able to carry, um, you know, gloves, rain jacket, hat, um, and possibly even change into some warmer stuff because it got it, – I don't know how cold it was, but it did snow um, during the race. And so, and it was, I mean, the rain, it rained on us twice and it was cold. So carrying all, I mean, that's the kind of basic gear that you have. Um, gosh, I guess early June is when we really started spending a lot more time up there. Uh, oh, the actual week. Um, we, I went out, I think I drove up after work on Thursday. Um, and I got there in time for packet pickup on Thursday evening and, um, the mandatory, there was a mandatory packet pickup, uh, our packet pickup was available Thursday night and then Friday morning with an athlete meeting on Friday morning as well. Okay. So, yeah. You know, uh, I think there was at, at one point during the week, I was getting a little bit nervous. Um, I think just understanding that anything could happen, um, during that whole, and I didn't, just, I just didn't know what to expect, um, during the race. So, but that nervous, uh, nervousness turned pretty quickly into excitement. I started getting pretty fired up about it. I wanted to get out there and race. I wanted to see what it was like. And, um, yeah, you had a lot of friends doing it. Um, a lot of first time, a lot of first time folks. Um, so yeah, it, it quickly turned into excitement though. Nice. Yeah. Now, You know, I didn't really have a game plan except I wanted to do a lot of whole foods. Um, not necessarily basic, but try to get some some decent a decent mix of foods in. You know, get a little carbs, get a little proteins, get some greens and so forth, um, and hydrate. Um, years ago, especially living in Texas, um, it was huge to hydrate. Um, and one of my big game plans now is to start taking some sort of electrolyte drink um, five to seven days out and really, really get that into me. Um, and ever since I've been doing that, gosh, I can't say I've been really cramping, which used to be a big uh, hindrance for me down in Texas. So as soon as I started prehydrating and, and really getting that into me, uh, that seemed to help a lot on come race day. <laughs> you know, the earlier, the better, but a lot of times there's always the last minute stuff going on and running around like chicken with my head cut off. But, uh, you know, I, slept, I think I slept pretty well that night. Um, it was just getting to bed as early as you can. We had a three o'clock wake up. Um, uh, just, well, yeah, it's yeah, it's pretty crazy. But um, the house, thankfully, is was almost about 150, 200 yards from the start. Oh, so wow, everybody, that's awesome. Yeah, so everybody uh, and my poor girlfriend, she uh, she get she's she's one of those people who's got to get to the races early. Has got to get everywhere far ahead. It eases her nerves, and then I'm the guy who wants to roll up right when the gun's going off. So it was driving her crazy because we had one minute to go, and I believe it or not, I was still in the house. I was still in the house. Yeah. So what were we sprint. <laughs> I was Did still trying to wake up. I, I I still had coffee to drink. You know, I mean, like I was. You know, was, I, I got to roll. I got to ease into these things. Honestly, though, it's like I thought, heck, even if I rolled over there after the one gun went off, you know, you got all day. You got 20-something hours to do this thing, so five minutes isn't going to hurt here and there. But we got there. I jumped the fence. Um, every, people were real nice. They let me right in there, and uh, and I and I went off right as the gun went off, or I was there. So, wow. yeah, she was about having a heart attack, but uh, but I knew I knew we could get there. <laughs> You know, in the mornings um, before this particular race, there's there's a lot of times before an Ironman or something like that where um, I get pretty quiet. Um, it's my time to kind of visualize ahead of time, almost the whole race, you know, coming out of the water, getting in the water. And, you know, we're talking about Ironman, but um, 
a lot of times it's more mental preparation for that because you have the transition areas and you have all this kind of stuff. For this kind of race, because it's such a, a long race of, of one sport, um, it's really just making sure you have your basic necessities. You know, uh, like I said, the headlights and, and uh, oh, that was another thing too, the headlamps. I mean, um, making sure I have that, making sure I was warm or cold or whatever it may be. Um, for that first 13 miles before you hit the aid station at the race, it's saying, okay, do I have what I need to get through this? You know, am I going to be too hot? Am I going to be too cold? Those types of things. So I step outside for a minute and then I step back in, do a little quick evaluation. Um, other than that, it's just, it's getting your mind in the right place, you know? So didn't have a whole lot of time to do that. Um, got a good breakfast. I mean, three o'clock Katie was up making breakfast and, you know, down that real quick. And then, uh, Took a shower, which some people laugh at, but I'm like, hey, I love running after a shower. <laughs> Wakes me up. So, again, going back, I think for this particular race, there wasn't a lot of mental preparation. That all took place, I'd say, in the days leading up to it. You know, not, I mean, you didn't, I didn't have a lot of time in the morning to really get to do anything besides just literally get ready to go. So, yeah. You know, I mean, it was a pretty impressive start, uh, i got to say. Um, impressive just as far as the uh, the excitement. I mean, everybody was so just excited to be out there. Um, and all the, just, I don't know, it, it was a, it was, it's a big event, uh, Leadville 100. I mean, it's iconic. It's been going on for, I think, 30 years, um, if I remember correctly. And it transformed that town. Um, and so it's got to, hearing the history behind the town and everything, when you're there and you're at the start, um, once you're in that environment, it's just, a, the, there's a lot of energy, you know? So when I took off, um, it was a very easy start though, for the most part. I mean, it was impressive just seeing all the excitement, um, and seeing everybody being so happy to be there. But, <clears throat> you know, I go out of there at, gosh, I don't even know what we started running nine minute, nine minute miles or whatever. In my, in my rhythm, I'd say when I go out for an average run about 10 miles or so, I'm usually at a 730 pace or something like that. Um, 7.30 to 7.45 is normally my comfort zone for running, but I knew this race was different. And so I go out of there just smooth sailing and talking to people. Um, and we're rolling down road at that point too, and it's all downhill for a little while. But so it's just settling in, just assessing, you know, how's my body, how's my mind, and getting prepared for running into the next morning. Uh, it's a totally different mindset than I think 50 milers, marathons for sure, um, and all the other events that, that I do. A sea of lights. It's 4 a.m. Um, people are chatting. People are smiling. People are laughing. Um, and, and it's just a really neat scene because you can see after, after a few miles when we actually hit Turquoise Lake, um, you can start to see the runners because Turquoise, you run um, somewhat counter counterclockwise around the lake. And you can start to see the lights out up ahead of you across the water. And that's really cool to see the, the line and to see some of the, the front runners too, guys that are out there just crushing it. Um, and so that was really neat. And, you know, everybody was cold too. I remember that. And, uh, uh, you know, the sun came up and that was beautiful. Um, but, you know, it, it's just a surreal scene because here's, I think it was 700 plus runners, 750 plus runners out there um, wrapping around the lake, getting ready just to, to start climbing mountains, basically. So really neat scene, but a lot of, a lot of lights in the darkness. <laughs> How would you describe the energy? Was there a lot of positiveness at this point? Yeah, there was. And I, and I think everybody was excited. There were some people running maybe a little bit faster than they should have. Um, I think that every race is like that. Um, some people playing it very conservatively. Um, people, a lot of people were packing up, um, as far as, you know, there was five or six runners that would group together and kind of run along the trail together. And, you know, I was trying to scoot around some of those folks in the early end was running while I felt good. Um, but everybody, I mean, trail runners are a different, different animal. I mean, just super friendly, super laid back. Um, I think there's a lot of camaraderie too. Um, a lot of these folks. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, and, and it's hard to, it, I think that anybody that does trail races and, and does triathlon or Ironman, um, it's, there's definitely a lot of um, team aspects and helpful aspects 
in triathlon, but in trail running, it kind of steps up to another level. Um, I think everybody is so helpful to each other in trail running. And it's so much more about fun than it is competition. Um, I feel like that trail running absolutely can be competitive. Um, I've, I've been there. I've done that. Um, but I think ultra running brings in a different mentality. It's about toughness. It's about mind. Um, and it's about getting through it together. Um, maybe more so than Iron Man. Um, Iron Man, you know, you definitely see those people dragging each other in. I've run, I, I've stopped my races in Iron Man many a times to run in my teammates, um, to run in somebody that's maybe not having the best day ever. Um, and I love those days. I mean, I'll walk with anybody, you know, and uh, those are some of my favorite races is when, you know, I may not be hitting my goal, but that's okay because I get to walk with my buddy, you know. You know, I'd say that everything um, was pretty smooth. I, I wasn't feeling as strong as I would have liked. Um, I think that I just kind of felt a little bit on the lethargic side. Um, muscles weren't maybe acting the way they should have. Um, I expected to be a little bit more snappy. Um, I expected to be a little bit more um, awake feeling. Um, and that I never did shake that. Um, I felt that from the beginning and, and just – maybe at 80% of my, of my, uh, peak feeling, you know, feeling like I could just take on the world kind of thing. Um, so I was a little concerned about that, you know, come 20, 30 miles. I was like, gosh, this feeling just isn't going away. I thought it was just taking the time to warm up, but, um, ultimately I, I still felt just kind of dragged down a little bit. Um, but I wanted to keep going, obviously, you know, I, I, I knew I was going to finish from the beginning. I, I knew that there wasn't anything going to stop me from finishing. <laughs> All right. So the aid stations were were pretty well stocked. Um, some based on my previous races and so forth, um, I knew that sugar can burn you out after a while. Um, I think the same thing can apply for Ironman or in any other type of racing too. But um, <laughs> Joe Prusatis, Joe and Joyce Prusatis that own uh, that own excuse me past tense Pickhouse Trails down in Texas. You know, when I when I did some ultra racing with them, um, I'll never I'll never forget to this day when I came in at mile I think it was around sixty or something of running Rocky Raccoon down in Texas. And I said, Joe, this is this is some really hard stuff. Like I I didn't know what I'm doing here. You know, I'm running 100 miles on five days notice or something. This is crazy. He says, Well, how much have you had to eat? I said, I don't know, like six goos or something like that. <laughs> he looked at me like, Are you crazy? So he comes over with a plate of food, and I said that's, that's like a real meal. Like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, I can't eat a real meal. I'm running. He says, you have to. And so I did. I had potatoes and soup. And I think there's like spaghetti and some other stuff. And I felt like a new man. I was like, wow. I mean, like he was like, you, you were probably thousands of calories depleted at this point. So going back to Leadville, you know, I said, you know what, I'm going to do real food. And that was the game plan. A lot of, a lot of hydration. Um, drink a lot. Um, Stinger waffles are one of my favorites and the closest to real food you can get that you can just kind of carry around. Um, and I wanted to stay away from goose, like period. Like normally that's a go-to if training runs. It's great. Um, I think that some of the shorter distance racing, it's great, but, oh, they can just wreak havoc on you after a while. That's just my two cents on it. I had them as like a last ditch effort, but honestly I was relying on those aid stations looking for, um, looking for noodles, looking for potatoes, that type of thing. Um, They, yeah, they are. And so um, in between the aid stations, believe it or not, I had, uh, gosh, I think the only thing that I had for most of the races or most of the race was hydration, honey singer waffles. And I don't even remember what else I had, honestly. Like they were 10, 10, 13 miles apart, something like that. And yeah, when we got to Hope Pass, that turned into a long day. But see, there's one up on Hope Pass. And so I, I knew that was there. And so it, it did become a, I got to get to the next one. You know, after a while, I was getting hungry. Late at night, I was getting real hungry. And so um, one of the game plans, though, is, is I did buy some of the uh, Mountain House foods, and Katie was going to have them cooked up, some uh, chicken and rice and things like that. But when she did make it, um, it just didn't sound appealing. And so, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. Again, the, the nutrition plans and everything, I, I'm definitely not good at it. <laughs> 
But no. that's not why I'm on the podium, or that's not that's why I'm not on the podium, I guess. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, I, you mean as far as eating goes? Just yeah. as far. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to stay away from, sh- like, just pure sugar. Just, I wanted to try to get some real food the best I could. And I knew that I would be okay probably until 40 miles. And then I would start to have to pack in some some big nutrition. Um, so at 40 miles, I, th- I can't remember what I had. I, I, I think I grabbed some potato chips, some Fig Newtons, um, I think I grabbed some potatoes. Coke is a, is a magic for me. Um, that is one thing that I don't drink outside of racing, but come race day, I will drink a lot of Coke, and it is like magic. Um, I tell you, like, I don't know what's in that stuff, but <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like, it revives me like no other. Like, it, it will save my day, day in and day out, and I've used it for so many years. Matter of fact, that's one of the only things that I do on an Ironman run course is I do Coke, um, an electrolyte drink, and water, and I cycle those three for the entire marathon. And I know that. What's that? I, I, you were breaking up just a little bit. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, and so far I've been okay with what's on course, thankfully. Um, you know, but... Anyway, so the nutrition plan, again, definitely not uh, my strong suit. <laughs> okay. So whenever the sun starts to pick up, you know, what are the views of, like, whatever you use or you get this in the sun course? You know, that's one of the things that I've started to, to appreciate with any of these races. Uh, and maybe it's me getting older or whatnot, but um, it's always time for a little bit of gratitude and a little bit of uh, appreciation for what we're able to do. Um, for me to go out and run 100 miles, um, you know, I count my blessings every day that I can do that kind of thing um, because there's a lot of people in the world that can't um, or that feel that they can't do that. And so when I'm out running, I mean, there are times where I will stop and I will just soak up the moment. Um, and it, it, it's a good reminder. It's a good reminder of, of why we're really doing it. Yeah, we're doing it for the experience and for the camaraderie and the challenge, but we're picking races sometimes that we want to see that scenery. And, um, it, it was just, yeah. I mean, I think I even remember running, um, up Sugarloaf of Pack, um, right off of Hagerman Road. And I think that's when you can look out over Twin Lakes. And I remember, you know, jogging with these guys, jogging fast hiking up this thing and looking and saying, look at this view. And I think that it also helps other people remember too, you know, why they're really doing it. This is in, in such an area too, in Leadville, um, is because you get to look out and, at these beautiful mountains. This right. beautiful scene. Yeah, and it, it helps energize you and it helps just kind of bring you back a little bit. Nice. You know? Now, yeah. Whenever you start to get past the sunrise and start the sun start really coming out of the morning, eight, nine, ten o'clock, how was your mail game? Uh the mail game was good. I, I I don't I didn't really start worrying and we can talk about it, but I didn't really start worrying until much later. Um, when that sun started going down or whatnot. Um, there was still a lot of people around. Um, there were a lot of people around probably all the way through 50 miles. Um, it started, you know, slimming out a little bit. Um, coming down off, I think time from, gosh, I don't, I don't know where I was at that frame. Um, hitting the, was, it was fun running on just flat roads. You want to be trail running. You want to be in the woods. You want to be on the trails. You want to be in the mountains. And so coming down uh, power line and so forth and get back onto the road, that's a little bit dragging. So there's a little bit really? of downtime there. Yeah, you hit the road, and um, I don't know. There's just something about when, when, you're, when you're training on the trails and you're training in the mountains, when you hit the road, it's kind of like, let's get this over with. You know, let's, let's get this road section, you know, out of the way so we can get back on the trail, you know, connect with nature, whatever it may be. Um, but it's part of it. I mean, it's part of every, every race. I mean, you can't, it's very rare you can go out and run 100 miles on trail. So I mean, you're going to cross something, you're going to come across some roads somewhere. Um, but I think mentally, again, I was just still checking in with my body, making sure that, you know, uh, I was feeling okay and that the muscles were snappy. And then I was talking to people too. Like I said, there were people around, you talk to them, you pace with them, you run with them, you chat. Um, there was a couple of guys that I ran with almost the whole course that I kept, that I kept leapfrogging with. Yeah, you find this rhythm and you find this pace. A lot of times the guys around you are the same guys are going to be there the whole time. 
So once you settle in, it's like, unless they crack or unless you crack, you're going to be with them because you guys are running the same speed. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. So you get to the turning point where some hand station there, and you have a drop back, or you should have a drop back. I actually didn't do any drop backs. Really? No. Uh, no, none at all. And uh, I thought about it. Um, that requires some good planning, I think, as far as what's going to be in there. Um, again, my girlfriend, Katie, who was crewing, I had some other friends out there too, but um, kind of intermittently, but Katie was my sole crewmate and she was hitting every aid station pretty much that she could go to. I think she could go to every one. Of, uh, couldn't go up Pope Pass, obviously, anything like that, but she was at almost every one of them now. <laughs> I came into mile 40 though at Twin Lakes, uh, almost an hour ahead of schedule. And so I caught her off guard. She didn't have the food ready. She didn't have really anything ready. And it just rained on her too. So poor thing. But um, I came in there a little early. So I had to kind of just grab what was at the aid station rather than grabbing, you know, what, what she had had potentially prepared for me. You know, I could have. Yeah. And I did. I did. And I guess the worry, you know, is once you get into the rhythm, you know, once you get into that mindset and you just go, go, go. Um, I gave myself about five minutes at each aid station. <laughs> so it was like get in, get out. And uh, that did become a concern later on about getting cold and about getting stiff. Um, but I came into that aid station. Katie helped me with what um, I swapped my pack at that point because the pack that I had picked up the day before the race um, was bruising my chest, actually. And so that was starting to really, really hurt. The uh, The water on the front was just pounding away on my ribs. And uh, so I went to the to the my old pack, which is, has the hydration on the back. Um, so that was a relief getting rid of that. Um, I also wanted to be careful about how much I was carrying because I was going up Hope Pass. Um, so I was a little careful on the on the going up side, only carrying what I had to really to get up that. But at that point, I was still feeling good. Like I said, I was an hour ahead of schedule. Um, Terrence Ramirez um, helped me kind of plan based on my previous runs. We were pretty conservative, I thought as far as my pacing went, how long I could spend at the aid stations, all that stuff. Um, And it put me on pace or on course for between a 21 and a 23 hour run is what my goal was. So I came in there way ahead of schedule. Um, I grabbed what I could, made a quick little, quick little changes and whatnot and took off and went out of there. Uh, And that's where we cross over some water. We actually go through um, a little bit of water and then you start the climb. So I knew I didn't want to change my shoes right there. I wanted to change them um, actually when I came back. So I wanted to go over in a pair of shoes and come back and put on some grounds. So, yeah, so then we go up over to Winfield. um, And Hope Pass was just as brutal as I remembered it in training. Um, It's a lot of of hiking, a lot of fast hiking. Uh, It's hard to say you can run up Hope Pass. You can kind of jog intermittently and whatnot. Uh, And then you drop uh, an amazing downhill for several miles into Winfield. And um, you know, somewhat, I mean, you've got to be careful. You've got to, you know, you're descending for miles. And so you've got to really watch your quads. Um, You got to play it safe because you can blow them out pretty easy. Um, What's that? And your footing. Your footing, yeah. I mean, definitely. There's some. There's some extremely rocky sections there. And this is when I was using the poles for. You know, I had used them in training for two runs, and this is where I was literally using the poles just for stability, for uh, taking some of the pressure off my knees and and descending. Um, and because you can descend fast. I mean, it's a. I mean, it's you can get really scooting down if you want to, but you're basically an uncontrolled fall at that point if you try to run down. Um, so. I say that just as much as climbing takes its toll on you, um, the descending can be even worse and really takes, I think that people that train for downhills um, really have a big advantage because you can just make up so much time going down the hills uh, or down the mountains, literally. Uh, and Winfield's just really cool. Winfield's, you know, the 50, 50 it's actually a 103 mile race. So I think that's, you know, like 51 and a half, 50, 52, somewhere in that neighborhood okay. mileage. Um, getting into Winfield was nice though. It, it was nice getting in there. I was depleted. Um, one, oh, one of my big things, chocolate milk. Totally forgot. So chocolate milk, nearly almost every aid station. Yeah. 300 and something calories. Um, I've always done well on it. Um, it's, it's just, I don't know why, but I do really, really well on chocolate milk. So she, Katie had one of those at every aid station for me. Um, nice and, and what's that? Nice and warm. 
<laughs> no, it was cold. It yeah. was cold. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I don't know about warm chocolate milk. Oof. But uh, so I came in there apparently looking looking not so great. And right as that nutrition went in me, it was like I, they said I just looked like a new man within 30 seconds. Um, so I recharged and, and, and went out, um, headed back up over the pass again. And so, uh, that's a, that's, that's the hardest section of the course where you've got to know what's ahead of you, um, for Leadville. You've got to know hope pass. And I think that if you pre-run it, you can get your mind around that. And that's what, that's what gets you over it. Because I think a lot of people really suffer with getting back up over that because it is a brutal climb back out of there. It is steep. It is slick. Um, there were some really tough sections in there where I just dug in with those poles and almost like lifted myself up um, to get up over Hope Pass. I think it would have been really hard, um, honestly. Um, I think that it, at my fitness level at the time, um, that would have just been really tough. I think it would have put a lot of strain in areas that I didn't want to have strain in. <laughs> Dollar wise? Oh, gosh. Uh, I think I got them on sale. I'm a bargain shopper. Uh, 70 80 bucks somewhere in there uh, super lightweight um i gotta tell you um worth their weight in gold um i mean those things were just amazing uh i, I really liked them I, I mean i think for that course for that run um I'll, I'll, I'll i would always have them with me um and uh yeah i was very grateful that i had those definitely So, no, I, I, I didn't, and I think a lot of people were a little bit shocked about that. Um, so Terrence, uh, Terrence Ramirez, you know, always a positive guy and, uh, you know, offered to pace, and he was prepared to pace. And then my friend um, Chris Mandelaris from – actually, a buddy from Austin uh, who's traveled a whole bunch, and now he's in the Boulder area. He was going to come finish me out with the 13 miles to go. So Terrence was going to run with me for around 37 miles, and then Chris was going to hop in. But a week before the race, you know, I was getting a little in my head, and I, I thought that, you know, being out there and running would allow me time to think, um, which I can always appreciate, um, put life into perspective, um, reflect a little bit, and then kind of, uh, you know, look at some future goals in life as well. And so I, I, I reluctantly said to Terrence and Chris, hey, guys, I want to start, I want to think on my, I want to do my own thing. And so a week before the race, I said, you know, guys, I'm good to go. I'll be okay. Um, and they definitely understood. Um, what's that? Yeah. 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 Wrap my mind around two years of hard work. Yep. <laughs> right. You know, it started getting a little more challenging coming down. Um, I was, I was still feeling okay. I think, um, I got into the aid station on the other side of Hope Pass and, that's where I sat down and was like, I need, I need some food. I, I really was like, okay, I got, I got to get some stuff in me. And I got to say the volunteers on this course, the best I've ever seen, hands really? down, hands down, the best volunteers I've ever seen. Um, they, they know what you need. They know your equipment. They, they, they just foresee it because you don't want to talk. You don't want to explain. You just want to get in there and get what you need and, and get on with your day. And those guys foresee everything. They know your pack. They know how to open it. They know how to fill it. They know everything. They know that you need your poles out of your hand. You know, they know that you want to sit down. And these, so these guys are just phenomenal. Uh, they, and the ladies and everybody out there were just phenomenal. So I came into the to the Hope, Paid, Hope Pass uh, aid station, um, heading down toward Twin Lakes. <clears throat> and I just said, I sat down. I said, potatoes and ramen and Coke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I, I think I might have caught wind of it, but I haven't really looked at it. <laughs> so that's what I said, and this guy came over, and he had ramen noodles and broth and potatoes and Coke, and I just took all that in and I was like, ah, oh, thankfully I can get going now. So I got up, was already starting to get a little sore and I started my way, making my way down to, uh, to Twin Lakes. And so I made it down to Twin Lakes and, uh, Brian and Hannah Cox were down there and that was awesome. Oh, the, Brit the, the Brit and the beard were there. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, you gotta love seeing them. You just got to. 
And uh, so that was that was really awesome seeing them. Uh, oh, and I forgot I saw Chris McDonald on the way out. You know, I don't remember what mileage, but, you know, um, it was raining. And he was out there. <laughs> and I was in the middle of the woods in Nowhereville. And there's Chris McDonald. And I was like, what the heck? So that was really good seeing him. And knowing he was on course was just awesome. Um, so uh, just a just a great guy, you know. And Katie was there, uh, and, a, and a couple of their friends were there. And I came in, and I was like, I got to get ready for nighttime. I mean, it's mile 60-something. Um, I knew I was going to get cold. Hypothermia is my worst enemy on these hundreds. Um, I know myself well enough that I will get extremely debilitating cold, um, even with mild temps. So I changed, washed up a little bit, um, put on, got all my night gear ready to go, packed up. Um, into an aid station and grabbed me some potatoes and uh, had more of those, had some more Coke. Um, I think I had some more chocolate milk, um, maybe some soup too, you know, because that was my new formula. I figured it out as I went. Um, so I got all that stuff in and then out I went. And I, I made Brian, I said, Brian, give me, I think, five minutes. And he started the timer. And then at five minutes came, I said, I need some more time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, I got out of there and, uh, and prepared and started preparing for the night. Yeah. On the way back. What was it like being on the course all day, like mentally? You're out there running when the sun comes up, and then you see the sun go up, and you just go, and then go down. Like, you know, it's crazy because you would think that you have this feeling of a very long day, but you don't. Um, yeah, it feels like it goes by. And that's the really wild thing. Like, I didn't think, oh my gosh, you know, I just saw the sun come up earlier today. And now I'm watching the sun go down. Um, it, it does go by fast. It definitely goes by fast. Um, and then in the nighttime, like, you know, I don't know. There's some, there's this surreal feeling when you start running at night on a trail. And uh, I didn't get as delusional as I did the last 100 I did. <laughs> How many people are around you at this point? You know, this is where it started to spread out um, quite a bit. Um, a matter of fact, I was literally trying to latch on to kind of a few other folks just to have people around me. Um, for just for, yeah, safety, camaraderie, whatever it may be, just, you know, distracting, if anything. Uh, I love running and distracting, which sounds really strange, but thinking about something else. So, um, <clears throat> you know, just, yeah, you never know what's going to happen out there. Um, so I, so it, it was very few and far between. If I, I mean, there were times where I turned off the headlight in the middle of the woods and there wasn't a soul to be seen or a voice to be heard. Um, and that's a pretty How cool awesome thing. Was that? It was pretty cool. You How know, many I mean, stars could you see? Oh my gosh, the stars were phenomenal. And uh, well, besides when it was raining, because it did start to rain about two o'clock in the morning. So, um, but yeah, before that, I mean, the stars were even in the morning. Race morning is gorgeous. Um, really funny thing we saw mice running around on the trail. They were what? grabbing the goo. Yeah, they were grabbing goo packets and stuff, you know. And that was their their big day, you know. They got a goo pack, and so you know, drop wrapper or something like that. But there were mice all over the place, and they would run along the trail right with you. It was really wild, you know. No, no. But, um, yeah, so so at that point, you know, there was just a few a few guys around. I mean, that's it's so spread out, that 50 miles coming back in, 60, you know, 40 miles coming back in. Um, it's real spread out. It gets uh, – that's where your mind really has to, to be strong. I mean, you've got to really be able to go out there and, and, and fight any kind of thoughts you're having and fight any thoughts your body's having. Um, and that's what that's what makes ultra, ultra runners um, some of the strongest-minded people out there. Is being able to push through that, you so know. For you, what were your mental thoughts that you had to fight through? So for me, it was not it was not getting the sub twenty five belt buckle that I was on pace for. Um, at mile seventy is when I, I I just remember starting to walk at mile seventy and say, okay, I've got to change my game plan, and that's okay. Um, that's okay to not get the tw- the sub twenty five. Um, and I came into the aid station. I think it was called Outward Outward Bound. Um, and and I was pretty. <clears throat> It's pretty deflated at that point, um, but I, and I knew I would finish. But walking is so slow, and power hiking is so slow that in the back of my mind I was like, I can't be out here all day. You know, that's the that's the hardest part for me, and why I try to race fast during Ironman or any other event is to get off course because the people that are out there for a long, long time, they're some of the toughest people in the world. I mean, those people can endure so much. So I try to go faster, so I can, I'm not out there that long, but I couldn't. At mile 70, I was shut down to, I mean, at the best, 
an extremely s- slow jog. I, w- I was done. But I knew that I could finish one way, shape, or form. Yeah, yeah. And then power line was in there, the, inf- the infamous climb up over, I guess it's Sugarloaf. Um, getting back up over that first peak, you had to go back up over that at mile 80-ish or so. So I knew that was ahead of me. And I knew that was going to be grueling. And uh, I had coming out of Outward Bound, there were two guys, um, really neat guys. One guy was pacing, um, and the other guy was, a, uh, I think, a Japanese fella who was completing the Grand Slam. So he was doing Western States, I think, in Vermont, perhaps, and a couple of the ultra races. And so Leadville, Leadville was part of it. So I think he brought on this pacer that knew the course really well. So I was behind them. And they were talking a lot, and they were doing their thing, and I was just in the back, just head down and going. And I really, you know, I was listening to them because it was conversation. I wasn't really engaging. But when we hit power line, it really turned into it. I mean, all, you know, the pacer was fresh. He was feeling great. But this other guy was really struggling, and I was right there with him. And we were just getting poured on in the rain. It was, I think, sleeting too. And we were going up this muddy power line road or power line climb, and it was just one foot in front of the other. And just you just getting up it and you're just fighting through it. And, uh, you know, your mind is set with, okay, at least mine was, the 25-hour mark is gone, but I can get there in under 30. So let's get this done. And it was just evaluation of body, evaluation of mind, just one step after another. And, and repeat. Here you are talking about five hours like it's not going to be able to handle it. That's another five hours on your feet, and it's going to be a little bit of Yeah. It it really is, and <clears throat> so my projections were starting to change. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Once once I. I wasn't worried about that 25 anymore, you know, that sub 25. I kind of put that out. I mean, and the funny thing is, is it's a teaser because you just never know. Maybe you're going to get a second, third, fourth, fifth win. Maybe there's going to be some nutrition that just blows you away and that you're going to be able to start running again. Um, so there's always that teaser, you know, out there that you can maybe still make it. And a matter of fact, the guy in front of me on power line was his pacer was still telling him that he could. And uh, it would have been brutal to try to get that. And I would have been hurting and I would have been, really sacrificing my body to make that happen at that point. So I decided that I was going to enjoy it as best I could. So the, the best part about power line though is up at the top is uh, the unofficial aid station and that's space station. And that's where they uh, have all sorts of uh, fun stuff that is legal in Colorado and not other States. Um, and it's just a really there's aliens in the trees. There's glow sticks everywhere. There's always this really, and it's historically just a crazy, crazy aid station. And I heard these horns being blown. And the pacer turned around and goes, have you guys heard about Space Station? I said, yes, I, I have. And uh, you never know what you're going to expect when you get up there as far as what people are wearing. I mean, they could be wearing, you know, Chewbacca outfits. They could be wearing literally nothing. You just never know what you're going to get when you get up there. So I get up there, and it was the, the nicest, craziest, fun group of people um, that oh, I was so happy to see because they filled up my pack for water. They gave me nutrition. They did all that stuff. I didn't participate in any of the other stuff that they were offering, but um, it was uh, it's really fun. It's really fun. So I was glad to see those folks. And at that point, I lost those two guys, and uh, we're back to doing kind of my own thing again and running through the woods in the darkness. Wow. You say woods, so this is like, there's some sections, yeah, we were hitting the Colorado Trail at that point. Um, I, well, no, the Colorado Trail was back a little ways, I'm sorry. Um, oh, gosh, it, it was definitely, I mean, there was some, is open Jeep trail type, but at this point, you are in a wooded area. The, I think there's some single track mix in there. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but, I mean, there's definitely trees around versus open, open space and so forth. Uh, and this is where you start, uh, once you get up to the top there, you start descending at some point. Um, and that's that view that you can look out over Turquoise Lake. But at this point, the sun wasn't up yet, so it was all dark. Um, <clears throat> you start descending, and the next aid station is a, it felt like eternity. Uh, it, it was felt like it was just so far away. 
Um, they had said six or seven miles, but it, it just felt like it was a lot more. And I could be wrong on the distance there, but um, which was um, May Queen was the next aid station. And it took a lot to get to May Queen, um, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think so, because I was having trouble with the descending. Um, my legs are really torn up, um, and my muscles just weren't there anymore uh, to do any kind of running. So every every large drop, every large rock seemed like it was just a hurdle um, to get over. And so, and then, it be, then there were a lot of people that were actually still running at that point, too. And they were blowing by me, and I was like, oh, my goodness. How are these people still running at this point? Like, I'm a good athlete, but this is tough. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how well you can do with a plan, right? I, 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 ought, to, I, I ought to try one one time just to see what I'll do. <laughs> uh, hey, what do you know? So, um, you know, I got into May Queen and I climbed into the van and um, my friend Richard was gonna was actually offering to pace me at that point because um, uh, Richard Toy, uh, he's out of uh, he's out of Austin and he was going to pace George and George unfortunately. Um, uh, didn't have the race that he wanted, um, and I think bowed out uh, in, in Winfield. Um, and so Richard, you know, was like, "Hey, I want to come. I'll, I'll come help Chris. We'll, we'll wrap up the last 13 miles together." And I've known Richard for many years, and a great guy, and I'd love to have him along. So <laughs> I climb into the van though, and there's Richard in some little short shorts. And I was like, "Richard, it's like 30 degrees out there, man." I was like, "It's it's cold. Like I'm I'm spandexed out and jacket and everything." And he's like. Uh, well, maybe I didn't bring the right gear. <laughs> I said, you're going to freeze to death, man. I was like, you can't wear that. And so, uh, and Katie's trying to pump nutrition into me. I'm doing chocolate milk and all that kind of stuff. And then lo and behold, I look at the window cause I hear a little tap and there's Chris McDonald, you know, knocking on the window. <laughs> and he said, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he's, he says, well, you aren't going to, you aren't going to finish the race by sitting in the van, <laughs> something like that. And, uh, it was good to see Chris and uh, Chris. Chris was going to pay some folks in, uh, one of his buddies um, from Denver, and he said, "You know what? I can't go with these guys, but they're literally fast walking, hiking. I need to hook you up with them. You need to la- get on with these guys and take it on in together." So I met up with the the mats, two mats. One was a pacer, one was a racer, and they said, "Chris." And after I jumped out of the van and and uh, got nutrition and stuff, I said, "They said, Chris, we're we're not going very fast." I said. Neither am I. <laughs> so, and so I hooked on with these guys, and man, they were they were awesome. I was starting to get pretty tired at that point. Um, my mind wasn't, you know, it, I was trying to hold on to it, but it was I was getting a little bit goofy, um, which happens. Uh, and my thought was, I got 13 miles to go. Katie says, "Do you need any nutrition?" And I'm thinking, 13 miles? No, that's like two hours. No, we're good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I was thinking two hours. I was thinking I can run this in an hour twenty-five, hour thirty, right? Right? Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, like this is. I don't need nutrition for this. Yeah. <laughs> Four something hours later, like literally, like I was. I mean, we had gone three miles and it had taken us an hour. And he goes, "Yeah, we're on a nineteen-minute." And I was like, nineteen-minute miles. How are we going nineteen? But we couldn't go any faster. Like it was just crazy. Like we we tried. I couldn't go any faster. The mats couldn't go any faster. It was crazy how slow we were going. And I said, guys, I can't be out of here this long. I got to get off this course. Like, I got to do something. But I couldn't go. And so I'm like, I'm not going to be out of nutrition. So they gave me, <laughs> they had some Scratch Lab chews. That's what I had for the last, I think, four hours or three, whatever it took me for the last 13 months. Yeah. At that point, that's that's when you know I wasn't right because so I didn't. Make the case, it? Oh my gosh! I should have taken a plate of food with me, something, because man, that was brutal. That was absolutely brutal. So thankfully, I had enough hydration, but not enough calories. I mean, not no way, no way, I had enough calories. So we marched on back, and uh, at one point, Matt said, "Hey, Chris, all right, we're gonna we're gonna start to do a shuffle." And, and, you know, once we hit the road, we'll start doing a shuffle back into town. And, we, and that's like at four miles to go or something like that, four or five miles to go. I said, all right, whatever it takes to get there. So we get out there, and Matt starts to shuffle. And I try to shuffle, and my body wasn't having any part of shuffling. Like, it was <laughs> – um, there was no shuffling going – there was nothing going on. I mean, I couldn't budge. And I said, you know what, guys? And they, and they tried so hard, and 
oh, bless those guys for trying to, trying to bring me along. But it was a death march at that point. And so I death marched it, and the sun was coming up, and the sun was in my face. And uh, I knew I was going to get there, but that was the longest 13 miles I think that I've ever experienced in my life. That was that was just that march back from me. And, and, and you know, the funny thing is, is after all of it, Terrence says, well, you were on pace till May Queen. <laughs> And I was like, well, thanks, Terrence. I, I'm pretty well aware of that. <laughs> so, uh, but that was a funny perspective because it took everything I had you know, from that last station, aid station in, uh, to get in there. And I knew I was going to finish, but it was so long to get back. Well, and, that, and that's, that's, I think, the probably the most important question for all ultra runners. I really do. Because um, there's a challenge aspect of it, but that's only one piece. Um, I think it's to always find out how strong you are and to reevaluate your strengths and, and, and where they are. Um, and to understand that no matter what life, what life throws at you, you can get through it. Because if you can get through 100 miles, especially with 15,000 feet of gain like we did had, I think it's what the, the course provides, um, through rain, through cold, all that kind of stuff, you know that if life throws you something else, that you can get through it, that you have a mental strength, that you have patience, um, that you have um, the ability to achieve a goal. Um, I think that's the key thing with endurance athletes is understanding that, um, that you can, if, if you, if you can get yourself to finish something, um, like the, these races, uh, as particularly Leadville, then I think that whatever challenge comes up, you can do it. You, you know, you can, um, because you've been through a lot and you know, it's, it's, it's nice to, um, understand that about yourself is, is that life can be tough. Uh, I work in an environment in critical care where, um, I see the worst of the worst and I see the best of the best, but, um, you know, struggling through life with, um, all different disease processes and with their families there with them and everything. Cause I've worked in, in critical care for 17 years now, 17, 18 years. I think I've been in the field. Um, and I'm always, I'm always in awe at what people can get through. So it's nice to reflect on that when you're racing and then take that and apply that to your, to your normal life, if you want to call it a normal life. Um, so, so I always remember that when I'm out there is I'm like, this is building mental strength. Every step I take, every, you know, every painful moment, um, it's building mental strength and allowing you to get through, um, anything else that presents to you in life. Yeah, I had I knew the course. Uh, what what I didn't know is this: <laughs> Brian Cox was going to come flying up on a mountain bike that was about falling apart, <laughs> and and try to try to encourage me back in. Uh, so he found me with about a mile to go, and uh, and that was pretty cool. He was texting Katie up ahead saying he found me. I wasn't dead, um, which was good. Uh, <laughs> Oh man, and, you know he was chipper as can be, as, as all you know. It's like just I think I think he even had a cup of coffee with him. I'm not sure, but um, and so uh, what's that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So it was good to see him, and he and he and he hopped off the bike, and he's like, "Man, this bike's falling apart on me." And so I, it was good to have Brian there, um, and a, a teammate, and just a good guy. Um, and in that last mile, um, you know, I got emotional several times on the course. I mean, definitely like, Hey, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to finish this series, you know, this whole lead man. Like, you know, I never know going into these things if I'm going to finish them. I think I am. I mean, I want to, 
Um, I knew I was going to finish the 100, but taking it all on this perspective, you have that last, the sun's coming up over the mountains. Brian's with me. I'm power hiking. I couldn't go any faster. That was fine. I was comfortable. And I was like, I can see the finish and I could hear the finish. And, uh, you know, it was just really cool to be able to walk in. And so for, I think it's the first time I haven't run across the finish line. Um, and I was okay with that. There's a video of me and I'm just walking it in. And uh, Mary Lee was there, um, you know, Mary Lee and Ken, the founders of this race. Um, and Mary Lee said, welcome home, lead man. Um, and that was awesome. And then I heard Ken. Uh, Ken said, come here, tough guy. And, you know, he gives me a big hug, uh, which was really cool. And Katie was there, and I gave her a big hug. I gave everybody hugs. Heck, everybody was getting them. Um, and it was a cool moment. It was a cool moment. There's some pictures of the finish line. Um and it was, it was just a big goal uh, to do the whole series and to know that I could do it and to finish it. Uh, so a lot of folks were there. Brian and Hannah were there. Um, my friend Carrie was there. Um, George was I mean, everybody was there. And it was just uh, – actually, George wasn't there. George was, uh, I think, back sleeping. Or, no, he did come. I'm sorry. I was, I'm forgetting he was there now. But um, – What's know. going on? Man. It, it was really, uh, it was a great finish. It really was. It wasn't fast. It took way longer than I thought, um, but it was still a great finish. Yeah. I've got all done. Yeah. So what's up with you, Mark? Are you going to go to this race or are you going to go yourself? You didn't want to pass on to someone who hasn't been in this race before. You know, obviously the training. Um, prepare for it. You, you got you to prepare for it. There was a 50% finishing rate this year, which is higher than normal. Um, and congrats to all those people. The amazing part was, is half of the field finished after me. So within the last two hours, more than half of the field, I think the numbers, if I, if I did the math right, um, finished after me, that was, that's incredible that people can be out there, you know, that long, uh, knowingly that long too. Like I didn't know I was going to be out there that long. Um, but preparing for the race, um, is the biggest thing because you want to enjoy it. You want to enjoy the scenery. You want to enjoy the camaraderie. You want to, you know, em- embrace the whole history of that race. Um, and then for other people, I mean, the, outside of training and so forth, um, I would say learn the history, learn the history of the race and, and, and understand that it turned around a mountain town in Colorado that probably wouldn't even exist right now. And that's, you don't hear that about races. You don't hear that a single race can have that historical effect on people. And then it's transforming what Leadville stands for now. It was a mining town. And Ken was there the day that Ken, the founder of the race, was, was in a mine the day they said, we're closing up. And Marilee was in uh, uh, the travel industry. I think she was a travel agent. And that people were wanting to get out of Leadville. They were asking her, how do we get out of here? There's Everything's closed. So I think that the history of the race is really what makes it special. The scenery is fantastic. The challenge is fantastic. The people are fantastic. But the history is where it's really at. And I think that the more I learned about the history of the race, the more you really feel like you're part of history. You're, you're, you're part of so much more. Um, yeah. So the first time you Climb. Climb as much as you can. Um, hike. Even hiking plays a huge role in that. Um, the long runs, uh, they'll come, but don't do not do it by distance. Do it by time um, because you never know how long it's going to take you, like me. <laughs> right. Because going out for a 30-mile run um, doesn't necessarily correlate to Leadville. Leadville correlates to time, and Leadville correlates to climbing. If you can climb well and you can descend well, I would say do all your training on, on hill repeats. Literally, I think you could do it all. Um, and know that the, the aid stations are well stocked. These people know what they're doing. They've done it for 30 years. Um, and a pacer is nice to have. <laughs> you should have had a pacer. Well, I think it would have been good company. Yeah. I really Not having one. I wouldn't say the words regret, but I, it, it would have been nice to have one. I mean, I think that the time solo, the stopping in the middle of the trail, turning off my headlight and just looking around, thinking I was lost at one point. Um, <laughs> there's value to both of those. There's value of solitude and there's value of the camaraderie. Um, I think that experiencing the race with other people, though, is invaluable. Yeah, I think those memories are uh, for lifetime memories, doing this type of thing. So as far as the race being complicated, 
it just it wasn't for him. It wasn't for me. For for a runner, I don't think it's logistically difficult. I think for your crew, I think it's vital for them. I think it's vital for the crew to learn and do their own thing. Katie stepped it up. She drove the course, or at least to the aid stations. She read articles. She consulted with George and with Carrie and with some my other friends as well. Um, I think your crew is vital for Leadville to understand the ups and downs, to understand that you may come in and want s'mores. You could come in and want steak. It's like you never know what you're going to want. Um, for a runner, you've got the easy job. You're just running. You know, your crew has got a really, really uh, tough job. And <laughs> Katie did phenomenal. It was her first time ever doing anything like this. And she anticipated my needs. She understood. She was patient. Um, she didn't like seeing me go back out into the dark. Uh, I think she cried at one point, um, seeing me go back out because she was worried about me. Um, but she, but she, I think by now she understands that I'll always make it through. At first she didn't understand that. Um, and now she does. Right. So she knows, she knows I can get through a lot. <laughs> okay. But the crew is, the crew is the key. I think in Leadville, um, pick the good people for the first timers. Pick people you know you can trust, that you know you can rely upon, and that know you well also. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hmm. I think I might do the whole series next year. We'll see. I told, I told myself I wasn't going to do another 100-mile run, but I said that six years ago, uh, and I did. So never say never. So yeah. what's next for you? So not this distant future, uh, I think in two weeks, uh, I'm going to run and go up and ride the Aspen 50. I did it last year. It's um, um, the We Do Sports team, Lance, Lance's uh, team, or Lance's uh, organization. They put on a, a pretty uh, pretty fun little mountain bike ride slash race. It is a ride that turns into a race uh, up in Aspen, and it's a technical course. It's a tough course. Um, that's just a little, a little 50 miler. Um, and then after that, Terrence um, Ramirez and, and Chris Cordova are going to run the 100K, uh, so 60-something miles, I guess it is, uh, Bear Creek, Bear Creek Lake. Um, yep, yeah, so nice flat course with just a few thousand feet of climb. So, <laughs> just a few thousand. Yeah, yeah. So that's on the agenda for uh, end of September. And so we're going to have a fun time. It's a, it's a looped course. Uh, we did it last year and had a good time doing a 50 K. So now we're going to bump it up to the hundred K. I think Chris is going to join us in that. Terrence and I are already in, uh, Chris McDonald's looking at it. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see if he hops in. So Lidville is a qualifier for Western States. Um, Western States is, I believe, my understanding. Uh, I haven't dug into the history of that race, but like one of the original ultra marathons in the U.S. Um, so I think Western States is is potentially on the agenda. Um, you have to apply; it's a lottery based system. Um, so I'll apply for that this year. Um, <clears throat> now that I have the qualifier with Leadville. Um, when will you know month, the end of the marathon? Gosh, I don't know when. I have to look at all the dates on that stuff. Um, <laughs> The big one that Katie reminded me of is uh, Race Across America, Ram. Uh, I kind of want to do a solo Ram. Um, so that's a lot of logistics. That's a lot of planning. I'm not a planner. So I might have to turn what myself. What would be more interesting for you to be a Ram or a Appalachian Trail? Because both of them are really awful. And both of them yeah. have different characteristics. And the Appalachian Trail is just as The Appalachian Trail, that, uh, that's, um, you know, I, 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 I took care of a patient once, believe it or not, that did the Appalachian Trail a few times. And um, that really stopped me in my tracks when I was caring for him. I said, you've done, you've done the AT, through, through hike the AT. He said, yeah. And he goes, and, I, and he worked in uh, the corporate world. Uh, I think he was well up, well up into the CEO type roles in his, in his position. And he says, I actually put that on my resume is through hiking the AT. And he says, and I get more inquiries about that than I do my, my skill sets or my quality, you know, my other parts of my, you know, my resume. Um, and he says it's absolutely something that uh, he would encourage to do. And it was an interesting conversation I had with him. But um, the AT, I haven't really um, dove into it as much. You know, I've done Ultraman. Um, so that was a, a checkbox that I wanted to achieve. Um, 
I, you know, the AT, I'd have to think about that, put some thought, you know, look into it a little bit more. It's I've looked a race. In, it's, it's not a race. That's a, uh, that's the fastest known time type thing. You know, um, you go out and you do it and it's, yeah, you definitely need a support crew. Um, logistics is very, very tough for the AT to through hike the AT uh, or to run it, whatever it may be. Um, you know, there's a triathlete, uh, Alyssa, I can't get uh, Gadeski. Yep. I think that if I'm hopefully pronouncing her name correctly, I followed her adventure on the fastest known time. That was pretty cool. Um, so it piqued my interest just a little bit. And, uh, you know, I watched the documentary on, on Carl Metzer running it. Um, so, you know, I don't know, but Ram, Ram intrigues me a little bit because there's, it's more social, I think. Uh, and I do like the social aspect of racing um, and the training that goes up to it too. I do like the social. So I think that Ram is a little bit more social where you have, you know, teams supporting people and you interact with the other teams and so forth. So um, I think it's a uh, ultra trail. Was it the Mont Blanc? I can, I'm butchering the name. I know, but there's another famous uh, ultra race as well. That's kind of been on my periphery a little bit too as a to do. So if there, if there's a challenge out there and it's a, it's a big race, I kind of want to do it. <laughs> nice. So how yeah. Oh, you know, I'm on uh, Instagram and Facebook. Um, I deleted, or well, I haven't deleted Twitter. I just haven't really been engaged in it in the last year or so. Um, but uh, Welchel in Colorado uh, on Instagram and Facebook, you just look me up on my name, Christopher Welchel. Um, and, uh, you know, I I usually will allow most people to follow. I know that sounds terrible, but um, I like to really engage with people. Um, and the human connection is something I value. So, um, you know, if we have an association of, passions for racing and passion then then i'll accept and engage you know with those with those folks um it's billy bob from china with a f- funny picture on there i may not <laughs> so, I'm little, so i'm a little selective on on that type of stuff not to be mean or, or anything like that but i like the engagement part of social media more than i like the followers uh, so so i've been actively trying to really uh make sure i'm connecting with the right type of people in my life so but yeah yeah. Well, Nice. It it is. It was uh I don't think I, I think you can train as much as you want, but it's still hard as much as you prepare. And the true trail runners, you know, I dabble in trail running compared to most. The true trail runners out there, those guys are amazing. The true mountain bikers, those guys are amazing. Right. Like, it's uh, it, it's it's just amazing the people that are dedicated to those types of Because, you know, I, I do road racing, criteriums, and I mean, I, I dabble in everything. I got seven bikes for a reason. Um, yeah, always, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, fat tire season's coming up. I'm looking for some snow racing. That, that's going to be my next adventure. I have not yet to, yet done it, and I've got a fat bike. And so this winter, I am looking for the fat tire racing in the snow. So right. that's going to be that's going to be exciting. Yep. <laughs> so Chris, I want to have one more question for you to wrap up, and that's what's your definition of a perfect race? You know, I I'd love to get into scenery and distance and locations and all that kind of stuff, but I think that there's so many of them out there that fit that criteria i think when you cross the line and you feel good and you've hit your goal um that's the perfect race you know there's a feeling when you cross the line um, when you've executed everything the right way and you've got to experience your friends potentially your family um scenery um, and and been challenged when you cross that line that's that's the perfect race when, wow. you, when you get when you get all those things checked off that's the perfect race Yes, thank you, sir. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you were able to learn something from today's episode. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to leave a review on iTunes or share it with a friend. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you'd like to see pictures from this athlete's race, learn more about who I am, what I'm doing, or be on the show yourself to share your story, check out my website at CoachTerryWilson.com. Until next time, continue the pursuit.